My name is Robert Meyer Burnett, and you are about to listen to a Sunset Sea production. I'll send you my bill in the 1099. <laughs> Uh, hey guys, uh, welcome to uh, episode two of Coffee with Holden. Uh, it's just me tonight. Uh, this is the second episode of my solo series that I've long neglected. Uh, I think the last video, last time I uploaded one was, uh, well, the only one I've ever uploaded was like months back. Uh, so we're here, and uh, without spending too much time dilly dallying or whatever, uh, I've got a, a movie that I'd like to talk about, of course, uh, and it's called. Uh, Hold on. It's called uh, it's called Uptown New York. Uh, it was made in 1932, and it is uh, part of uh, pre-code Hollywood, which was basically the uh, the period between uh, when they were still doing uh, silent films and and when they they had this like the Hayes Code put in, which was basically this this whole thing that uh, censored a lot of stuff, kept certain things out of movies, and made everything a bit sanitized. And that's where the the cliched kind of old-fashioned Hollywood stuff comes into play. It's like all, all the, they, they play it safe and it's it's kind of made for a, a general audience and all that. But yeah, before that, uh, you had you had pre-code stuff, which was more more creatively free. Uh, the artists, the, the, the create the artists and the writers and everything, they could kind of take it, in, take their work into the direction that they wanted to, to take it in. And, and they just had more freedom in that sense. And so, uh, yeah, without going on too much of a, rant because I didn't I didn't take it I, I don't have any notes on that so I can't really go so much further with it anyway uh convenient so uh but yeah um let's just start let's start talking about the movie uh because I'm doing this by myself I'm, I'm I've gotten very used to uh to doing it with a, a co-host so um just a preface uh for the the sake of this conversation or whatever it's not really well it's not a conversation but I'm basically just going to to talk about the movie, I'm going to basically uh, ask myself the questions because I normally ask my co-host the questions when we do our discussions. So it'll be like a bit of a self-discussion if that's not too weird. I don't think it's going to be that awkward or anything. We're just going to roll with it and see what happens. But um, I'm basically going to ask myself the questions. I'm just going to state the questions uh, or state like the question, basically the topic, and then talk about it. So yeah, anyway, uh, no more wasting time. Let's get right into it. So like I said, movie is called Uptown New York, uh, mid-1932, and uh, uh, the the plot goes as follows. So here's, here's, a, here's a summary of everything that goes down in it. So uh, in this movie, uh, there's a couple living in New York City, and uh, their names are Max and Pat. Max is the guy. Pat is the girl. Uh, Max is a, a promising young doctor from an upper-class uh, Jewish background, and Pat is his blonde-haired uh, Gentile sweetheart, right? Um, and so uh, when Max goes to uh, drop Pat off at her apartment after one of their dates, uh, he decides that he wants to spend the night. And so he comes to her door to, uh, to call for a cab, and they talk for a bit, and she agrees to let him stay. Um, the cab comes to the apartment anyway because he actually does uh, – I put it in quote, I said it in quotes, but he actually did uh, order a cab. I don't know why the lighting is so weird. Just uh, bear with me here. Okay, hopefully that's a bit better. Um, he uses, you know, the cab as an excuse to like, you know, try to spend the night with her and she, she wants to, so they do, uh, but the cab comes anyway and, um, and he, but, but he, he, to get rid of it, he basically, he drops a coin down from Pat's uh, window to cover the fare and the, uh, the driver happily takes off and leaves the two to their night together. Right. Uh, and then later on, um, Max is attending a, so later on, uh, Max is attending a dinner party with family and, uh, family friends. And his mother makes the announcement, or his father, his dad makes the announcement that Max will be marrying a Jewish girl, uh, the daughter of a prominent merchant, and that he'll also be moving to Vienna uh, to take a uh, to take part in a postgraduate course uh, in surgery because he's just earned his uh, medical license or his certificate. He can now practice, but um, he's going to continue his studies. He's going to further say he's going to be very well educated and he's going to be set up for life thanks to his uh, courtesy of his family. But of course, this goes in conflict with uh, the relationship that he has with uh, Pat, who uh, his family knows about, but they don't they don't like her because she's not part of their religion and everything. She's not part of the community. And so um, his dad's looking out for him in his own way, right? In his own special way, he wants him to be set up for life. He wants him to be, uh, you know, to have a solid start because he is a talented uh, surgeon or could be and is about to be. 
And so he just he wants to do everything he can to make sure that his son has what he needs in order to uh, be prepared uh, for all of that. And so, yeah, uh, he makes the announcement at the dinner party. Uh, and Max is, Max is clearly upset by this, of course. But uh, when his dad tries to talk to him about it after the party, Max tells him not to worry. He, he just says, it's all right, Dad, I understand. Um, and so then uh, the next day, Max explains the situation to Pat. He tells her that his father worked hard all his life to fund his medical education and get him to where he is now, and that he's essentially bound to them, bound to do, you know, he has, he's obligated to do what they ask him because it's the least he can, you know, do to repay them for what they've done for him, right? What they've given him. And so that, that's how he sees it anyway, right? And so he'll have to go through with the uh, arranged marriage and move to Vienna in order to repay them for everything they've given him, like I said. And, and he has a promising career as a surgeon ahead of him. And Pat tells him she understands and uh, lets him go, pretty much. And uh, from there, the, the passage of time is marked by a series of, of newspaper clippings. So there's this set of newspaper clippings that Pat has kept uh, over the months or years, it's probably years, uh, about Max and all the updates in his marriage and career uh, as, as time's gone by. Uh, he has achieved great success both uh, socially and professionally and is due to arrive back from Vienna that very same day. Uh, Pat leaves her apartment to go down to Coney Island, uh, where she's spent a significant amount of time ever since Max left. Um, to try to forget, you know. Uh, and then from there, we, we then cut to an Italian diner or a deli, something like that, in Coney Island, uh, where a man named Eddie comes to uh, collect the money that he's, that's been made from the gumball machine inside. So there's a gumball machine in there. Uh, and, and Eddie, he's basically uh, a gumball machine vendor, like, you know, the self-made entrepreneur. And that, that's his line, is, is gumball machine. So he goes around, he makes the rounds, collecting all of the, the pennies or, you know, the coins from... Uh, of, of profit from each gumball machine. And that, that's what he does for a living, right? That's how he makes his money. Uh, that's his bread and butter, right? So while, while Eddie's there, he, he orders a steak from the Italian owner. And, um, uh, but before he can eat it, uh, a woman, uh, ends up getting stuck in the, the bathroom there. And the owner asks Eddie to, uh, try and help her, try to help and, uh, get her out. Uh, Eddie reluctantly agrees, uh, he doesn't want to do it at first, but he just says, screw it up, you know, whatever, I'll help, why not? You've asked enough times, basically. And he ends up, uh, he ends up climbing on top of the owner. Uh, the owner lifts him up, and uh, uh, Eddie, they, they go outside. Uh, the owner has him stand on him, basically. He lifts him up, he stands on the owner's shoulders, and he smashes the window to the bathroom from the outside uh, open and pulls the woman out from it uh, onto the ground below. Uh, and they get the two of them get into a bit of an argument, the woman and Eddie. Uh, because the woman ends up uh, tearing her skirt in the process and asks uh, Eddie for a safety pin to close it. Uh, and Eddie gets a bit frustrated at this and goes back to his stake, but the woman follows him. Uh, and the woman is, of course, it's Pat. It's Pat from earlier. And uh, she asks Eddie if, she'll, if he'll walk her home so that her torn skirt won't be as obvious to people walking past her, you know, so it won't create this big scandal or whatever. And he, he agrees to do that. And, and they end up actually getting, uh, I think it's like milkshakes or just drinks at, at another diner and uh, talk about, they end up talking about why Pat goes to Coney Island so often, because it's, you know, it, it must be, a, it, they, they uh, establish that it's a bit of a weird time for a person to go to Coney Island, a uh, weird time of year for a person to go to Coney Island. It's usually when things are actually open or whatever, but she seems to go pretty much year round, it's like even during the, the times when there are lulls in business and lulls and events over there and everything, activities and whatnot. Uh, uh, but before the conversation can continue, she starts to kind of talk about the whole situation with Max. Uh, she hints at it, but before the conversation can go any further, however, uh, th there's this other man in the bar uh, or in the diner, and he makes a rude comment about uh, Pat's torn skirt, and Eddie actually ends up punching him unconscious, right? Knocking him uh, knocking him out, knocking him square on his feet, right? So uh, he and Pat walk away together and eventually arrive at her apartment, uh, and before she can go in, uh, Eddie asks if she'd like to uh, to go out with him sometime, basically. And uh, she's caught off guard by the offer at first, but ultimately agrees, right? However, uh, however, uh, from there, there is a surprise waiting for her back in the apartment. Uh, and it turns out that Max has come back from Vienna and still wants to see Pat. Uh, he stopped by at her apartment immediately after returning from the boat uh, trip home. And, uh, and he wants, he basically wants to have an affair with her behind his wife's back. Um, and Pat isn't too keen on the idea, 
and uh, doesn't want to be the background girl or whatever. Doesn't want to be a background character in his life. It's like she, he's he made his decision and it's over. They gotta stop seeing each other and all that. But but um, Max doesn't want to see it that way yet. Uh, so he repeatedly tries to sell it on her and uh, sell her on it. And she tells him to leave, and and he does. But then he calls her the next day, even though she asked him not to. And uh, she hangs up on him to go on her date with Eddie. And so there's a bit of a love triangle kind of taking shape, if you couldn't tell already. Um, and so uh, she and Eddie, they, they go to see a wrestling match together, which is interesting because, um, you know, the movie's called Uptown New York. And we've established already that uh, uh, Pat and, no, well, Max belongs to, well, Max and Pat and Max, they sort of belong to a specific uh, economic uh, and social bracket, right? Like uh, they are. They're a little more rich, ritzy and, and all that. And, uh, and uh, well, Eddie's obviously the opposite, right? He's more working class. He's this, he's a gumball machine vendor. You know, it's probably, it's the opposite side of the spectrum. Yet the two of them go out and they get along and they, and they have a relationship. Uh, she and uh, uh, Pat and, uh, and Eddie, right? But yeah, they go see, so they go to see a wrestling match, which is something that uh, Pat has never done before, because of course that's not the, part of the social sphere that she uh, uh, tends to maneuver in, usually. Uh, she's usually with people like, well, well, Max, right? So they probably wouldn't do something like that. But while they're watching the uh, the match together, she and Eddie, uh, Eddie tries proposing to her in, in the middle of the match as, as things are happening. But, but uh, she can't really hear him and she's confused. She's kind of, her attention is caught between the people fighting, uh, the, the wrestlers actually, you know, going at it and, and uh, Eddie's, you know, talking her ear off and the other thing. And it's just like a bit much. And, but, but, um, basically Eddie ends up getting, uh, from there, he actually ends up getting knocked out by one of the wrestlers because one of the wrestlers gets thrown from the ring and lands like directly on him. Right. And, uh, and so from there, Eddie is revived by several other men. And, uh, in the recovery room, uh, he proposes to Pat once more for a second time. And Pat asks for some time to think, but agrees to go out with him again tomorrow night. And uh, Eddie, he plans some sort of uh, engagement party at his apartment. Uh, but as Pat is is on as Pat is on her way to attend it, uh, she's called over by a, a cab driver in the street. And the cab driver asks if she wants a lift, and she walks up to the window and says, "No, thank you. Like thanks, but no thanks." But it, it turns out to not be a cab driver. It's actually Max uh, yet again. It's Max again, uh, and, he, and he wants to uh, to show Pat something. And she tentatively agrees, and he he drives her somewhere. Uh, but when they arrive to the destination, however, it turns out that nothing's going on. There's no special event. He said, he told, uh, he told, uh, he told, uh, uh, Pat that it was, there was something, it was an emergency going on or something, uh, or that it was something that was important, but, uh, nope. She, he's just brought her back to his, his apartment, his place when his, his wife's not there and he wants her to have drinks with him and probably spend the night, uh, together. Um, but yeah. He offers her the drink and she accepts one drink, you know, that, and they drink together in uh, Max's apartment as Eddie is back at his apartment, uh, calling her, ringing her number over and over again, trying to get a hold of her, wondering where she is, why she's uh, held him up and all that, uh, stood him up and all that. But um, yeah, meanwhile, Max tries to persuade Pat to be with him, one, be with him again, get back together with him, even if it's only on the sly, even if it's only an extramarital affair. Uh, but she tells him that the relationship is dead. Uh, even though she's conflicted, uh, basically the relationship is dead, right? And in the end, uh, she decides to remain faithful to Eddie and asks Max to uh, to drop her off at her place again. And uh, Eddie is actually waiting there. She's waiting on the steps outside her building. And uh, Pat apologizes for, for standing him up and uh, agrees to marry him. And the two wed. Uh, they, they go to a, from there, they go to a hotel to spend their honeymoon at. Uh, but there's a party in the room next door, even though they ask for a, a, a quiet room. Uh, the bridal suite is right next to this booming party, and it spoils the mood a bit. Um, and from there, Pat takes the opportunity to tell Eddie about Max and uh, about her past with him and lets him know that he can annul the relationship, uh, annul the marriage if he wants to. He can leave if, if that's something that uh, will be an issue because uh, she doesn't want to, you know, she does. She knows that it's complicated and she doesn't want to impose too much on him. Um and, and Eddie gets up and it, it makes, uh, he gets up from the seat because they're, they're sitting down when he tells him this. He gets up from the seat and moves across the room. And this makes Pat think that he's going to actually walk out on her. Um, but instead, he, he both uh, surprises and relieves her uh, by simply 
reaching for the phone. He, he gets up to go to the phone on the wall to uh, complain to the clerk uh, at the hotel lobby desk, whatever, about the party next door. And the two, the two embrace, uh, Pat and uh, Eddie. Uh, we then cut to Eddie's apartment once more, where he's uh, having a group of children try out a new series of uh, chocolate bars that he's hoping to sell in addition to his gumball machines. That's like his other uh, thing now. It's that he's going to try to sell uh, candy, basically. Uh, he's going to try to make and sell chocolate and you know other sorts of candy, I'm assuming. Right. But um, but none of them really, uh, he tries to get them all to sample it and give them feedback, but none of them really have anything to say because they're all kids. So uh, it's just a nice little lighthearted moment. He has them all leave, and um, Pat Pat is, is charmed by uh, by Eddie's childlike nature in this sense, right? Because he's a gumball, you know, he said he's a gumball machine vendor. He's a chocolate maker. You know, he's kind of like a kid at heart, and she she likes that about him. Uh, and not, not really in like a patronizing way, but in like a genuine, like, you know, like wholesome kind of way, right? Uh, so yeah, uh, Pat from there, she steps outside for a moment, uh, where she sees a, a group of children. There's this group of kids hiding behind a produce stall across the street, uh, for some reason, maybe they're trying to play a joke or maybe they're trying to steal, uh, the lettuce or whatever, but, um, she tries to shoo them off, uh, but ends up stepping in front of a truck. She steps like directly and she steps like she walks right into the middle of the road and gets hit by a truck, uh. And Eddie is late to find this out, but um, when he does find out what happened to her, uh, he, he comes across her lying in a bed, and uh, when he tries to wake her up from her stupor, uh, she calls out Max's name uh, instead of, of his, instead of Eddie's, right? And so Eddie takes this as a sign that she still loves Max. And uh, from there, they go to the emergency room, and the, the doctor tells Eddie that Pat will have to undergo a, a complicated spinal operation. And asks Eddie if he knows any doctors who could uh, he, that he could recommend to do the job. And Eddie ends up visiting Max's practice. Max himself, uh, he barges in on him during a consultation with another client and tells him about the situation with Pat. And Max rushes to help her and uh, does the operation and uh, in the end saves her. So she's uh, fine because of him. So he actually saved her life in, in the end. right? But um, However, as she's recovering, uh, Max once again, yet again... Uh, asks Pat to be with him, basically begs him to begs her to be with him again. Uh, he even tells her to end her marriage with Eddie. And uh, Pat is still in a delirious state at this point, so she can't really respond. She doesn't really know what's going on. Uh, so yeah, yeah, that's great, isn't it? Max is trying to. Well, we'll get into that, but yeah. Um, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie walks in on on her on him as uh, walks in on Max as he's delivering this pitch. And uh, basically assumes the worst, right? Because it's it. First, it was uh, first it was it was Pat saying Max's name while she was unconscious, right? As if to imply that uh, she cares about him more than she cares about Eddie. Uh, and now it's Max trying to put the moves on uh, Pat, and so he just he assumes that they've got a thing going on, and that the marriage isn't as. Uh, locked tight or whatever as he thought it was and that it's not real the love isn't real love isn't there so so uh so yeah eddie uh eddie leaves he he walks out he sells his uh he ends up selling his gumball machines and uh chocolate recipes to pay for the medical bill uh from the surgery and uh leaves a note with it uh telling pat that he's walking out basically and th there's a thing about the medical bill basically max p paid for it already he covered the expenses but uh, Eddie wants to be, he has, you know, he has this pride thing about it. He does, he wants his own wife. He wants to be able to pay for his own wife. So he, he puts everything on the line. He sacrifices everything. He gives it all up just to, uh, to pay for her, right? Just to pay for it, even though it's already been paid for just, just for this symbolic gesture, this, this last goodbye. Uh, and then he leaves, he leaves a note basically that, that reads, um, it, it talks about how, uh, basically just says, you know, uh, Hey, uh, Hey, this is Eddie, right? Hey, uh, Pat, you told me earlier in the hotel during our honeymoon that it would be okay if uh, I annulled the marriage if the thing, the whole, the whole situation you've got with uh, Max became an issue. So uh, yeah, it is an issue basically, and I am going to take you up on your offer and, and walk out until the marriage is over. That's basically what it says, long and short of it. And uh, by the time Pat has recovered, um, the note's there, and she can't find Eddie anywhere. She can't. Uh, track him down he's not in his apartment or whatever so it seems like for all intents and purposes it's over and that he's disappeared 
and that yeah it's done and um and max himself max is is there too he, obviously he's there at her apartment again yet again and uh he's basically he's made plans for her to go on a cruise with him and his wife uh but it, but he tells her to he, he buys her a ticket a solo ticket to try to make it less embarrassing you know uh it's going to be another it's going to be an on on the down low kind of thing and he, he tells her to think of him as his doctor and not his ex and not i, I mean think of he tells her to think of him as her doctor and not her ex um and and to think of the trip not as like a way for them to to get it on together not as a romantic getaway for the two of them but but rather a, as a way for her to recover from the accident and the uh, operation so if you couldn't tell already uh, max is a bit of a scumbag right max is a bit of a snake um so yeah uh and well they, it ends up getting to the point where uh she's about to leave she's about to get onto the boat uh at the docks uh but while she's at the docks however uh pat sees someone taking money from a gumball machine and uh she assumes that they're trying to steal it and uh she goes to yell at the guy and try to stop him and, and a police officer intervenes and uh it turns out that the uh the machines actually they no longer belong to eddie uh because again he sold them all to pay for pat's medical expenses right so uh from there pat then runs into one of eddie's friends and from the friend she finds out that eddie got into trouble for selling the business because he only owns half uh, he when they got married when he and Pat when she and Pat got or when God when he and Pat got married, Eddie gave half of the business to Pat and so Pat has to she she owns the other half and she needs to sign the uh, the agreement to make the the deal that he had official make it legitimate so that's so that created problems with uh so that created problems for Eddie with the guy that he traded his stuff that he did the deal with right so yeah. He got the money, but the guy didn't get the business, and so he got into a fight with with the guy and some of his friends or whatever. And um, when a police officer went to try to break up that fight, uh, he ended up punching the police officer, and so now he's actually in jail—not prison, just just jail. And um, yeah, Pat, uh, Pat, and the friend, Pat and Eddie's friend, go down to the jail that uh, he's at, that Eddie's in, and. Uh, they visit the jail, uh, post the, uh, the $50 bill for him and Pat reconciles with Eddie and she explains, uh, that she wasn't unfaithful to him. She wasn't unfaithful to him with Max and that she doesn't want their marriage to end and that the whole thing with Max is, is long and over. It's, it's dead, dead in the water, uh, water under the bridge, so on and so forth. Um, and, and Eddie takes her back and, uh, the movie ends from there. So yeah, that's, a uh, Nice, like a uh, twenty-minute uh, summary of everything that goes on. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much that. Uh, let me just take a sip of water before we get into the uh, discussion portion of the, uh, the video. Or rather, of this episode of the podcast, right? Um, so yeah, uh, I guess before we get into like how I actually feel about the movie or whatever. Um, I guess for the fun of it, the interesting thing to note about pre-code Hollywood, uh, there's this, so there's this, the, the movie was produced or it was distributed by a company called, uh, the Sono Art Worldwide Pictures, the Sono Art Worldwide Pictures, right? But, um, yeah, the movie, it, it opens up with a, with a logo from this company. Uh, but it's funny because this, this logo in particular, it, it's interesting because, um, it, it, it's, it's actually, it's a naked woman. Uh, holding basically just just holding like two globes uh, over her breasts, and uh, this one reads uh, "world" and this one reads "wide," and above and below her is text, and and when you put it all together, it basically adds up to uh, a like a uh, worldwide picture. And so I, th I thought that was kind of funny, especially you know the Hayes Code again. The Hayes Code kind of makes most people assume that all movies from that period were like super sanitized and um i guess conservative not necessarily in the political sense but in the social sense right uh small c conservative but um yeah no you had you had stuff like that before uh before they they put a put a stop to it or whatever, before they called it all naughty naughty and said no 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 right but yeah uh I, by the way kind of i don't know fuck the haze code it's kind of lame uh pretty lame uh but yeah Sorry. 
you got to wonder how uh, American cinema and just cinema in general would have turned out if they hadn't had something like the Hayes Code, you know, if they'd let people just uh, express what they wanted to express, maybe people wouldn't have been so uh, uptight or whatever. Uh, that's the stereotype anyway, or that that's what, how we see. That's how I see it. I'm, I'm not an expert, but I wish I knew more. I wish I could be, but I guess that's part of what this uh, doing these videos does is that I, I learn a little more every time, right? A little more every episode. But yeah, so anyway, uh, I guess this is where we do the discussion. Like I said, I usually do this with another person. So again, I apologize. I don't want to drag on too, you know, too much about this, but like, I apologize if it's a little awkward, but I'm basically just going to read the questions out loud and then answer them myself. And we're just going to see how that goes, right? So uh, uh, to start, um, what would I rate this movie out of 10 and why? Well, I think for me, I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. 8, I think that's pretty good. Uh, because even though... Even though I will say this, even though the premise is, um, even though the premise is kind of, uh, kind of like cliched and, and generic and, and of its time, like something you would expect, it's very conventional. It's very like you know, oh, it's just a run of the mill uh, love triangle kind of story, right? You you could look at it that way. But what I will say is, is the the, the pre code storytelling techniques and the the stripped back uh, production, the stripped back quality of the production itself. Um, they, they, they lend the, the movie a much more, they lend the film a much more intimate feeling than, uh, than something of this kind usually would, would usually have. Right. Um, I guess in other words, like a Hayes code equivalent of like a romantic, uh, comedy drama like this, uh, th this one, it, it's very, it feels a bit raw. It feels a bit raw. It feels a bit realer. There's, there's a groundedness to it that you wouldn't get with a, a super sanitized or polished, uh, uh, production, let's just say. Uh, and and script, just script in general, right? Uh, but yeah, it, this movie it's it's very much a character driven drama, right? Uh, with a small cast and and very few set pieces. Uh, the relationships between the three main characters are fairly nuanced and developed. Excuse me. And there's a lot going on uh, beneath the surface, right? Uh, and, and when the movie wants you to feel the tension that it wants you to feel, you you feel it. Uh, Especially when Pat gets hit by the truck uh, unexpectedly, it just comes out of nowhere, right? And and it's weird because I mean, just just looking at the script itself, looking at the actual structure of the script itself, uh, the structure it, it's structured somewhat unconventionally. Um, in that, a, a lot of the drama, a lot of the, the film's drama is sort of, I guess, crammed into the last twenty four minutes or so, right? And it's it's almost as if the climax is immediately followed up by the resolution with uh, with no time for any sort of falling action as you'd usually get in a film uh, of this sort or just a you know a film in general right like a genre film um, so in that sense it, it makes for an interesting viewing experience overall and maybe this is true of most uh, pre-code movies in general right but uh, but watching this you get the impression that anything's possible right that that anything could happen within the context of the narrative itself like you're, you're, there's no guarantee that uh, there's no guaranteed like standard plot, right? Like point A to point B to point C. Like it, it's not always, it, you, it doesn't feel like the heroes are going to win. It doesn't feel like the good ending is inevitable. You, you don't really know what to expect and you don't really know how things are going to happen. There's, there's a much more ambiguous tone because you don't know how realistic they're going to go with it kind of is, is the impression that I got as I was watching. Because like I said, the techniques that they use to make it, the, the technical side of things, which we'll talk about, we'll get into a little more in just a second. They, they really do uh, ground it. They make it a little more realistic. And so if you think of this, this sort of situation in the context of, well, let's just say basic reality, right? Uh, if a girl has to choose between uh, a poor, a lower class guy who's charismatic, a lower class suitor who's charismatic, good personality, gets along well with them, but it just doesn't have the resources versus someone who is the exact opposite of that, right? Has a bit of a bad personality, is a bit of a snake, a bit manipulative, a bit controlling, but is a super successful surgeon or whatever, has all the social connections you could ask for, so on and so forth. Uh, if you had to choose between those two, especially back in the day, uh, you might, and, and well, to, to complicate that as well, don't forget, like uh, she thought that Eddie had left her, right? So when you think that your only option is, when your only two options are either being completely alone or being with your ex who just so happens to be like super rich and influential and all that, right? It's like realistically uh, a woman of that time or just a person of that time in general, you know, you'd probably, if the roles were reversed, you'd probably, you know, you'd go with it. A person in that situation, they would, they would roll with it. They, they'd take it probably uh, because that's just how, how real life tends to be. 
right? So I by, by the end of the film, I honestly didn't know whether or not uh, we would get the, the conventional happy ending, whether or not Eddie and Pat would actually end up getting together. Uh, there was it was weird. There was there was ambiguity, a- ambiguity, right? It was it was ambiguous enough to where I questioned these things uh, seriously, even up to the very end. And that that's the mark to me. That's a mark of a good film. It's better than knowing everything, knowing how everything's going to be plotted out from uh, from the word go or whatever, you know. So yeah, I, I liked it. It was a nice little change of pace. And I, I God, I kind of the more I have a feeling that the more pre code movies I'm going to watch, the more I'm going to hate the Hayes Hayes Code in general. It's like God, you guys really did stifle uh, artistry and creativity and all that for, for what too, for, for one group's uh, sensitivities. It's like, it's, it's the exact opposite of what's going on today, you know, but uh, we won't get too much into that, but let's just say that uh, uh, this, this stupid catering to uh, certain demographics or whatever has always been a thing apparently, but just back then it was for, I guess it was more uh, of a right of a right side of the political spectrum kind of thing. It was a more religious thing. It was a more conservative thing. So yeah, everybody's wrong. Basically everyone, Left or right, conservative, liberal, whatever, you're all wrong, basically. Uh, so that that's what we've learned from uh, uh, history and uh, today, I guess. Right? But yeah. Uh, so from there, from there, uh, it's just, uh, it's just uh, you go, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, you go from, God, where was that? Yeah, I, you never quite know what to expect, basically, is what I was going to, that, that's how I was going to close that thought. You uh, you never know what to expect, uh, based on what I've seen so far of pre-code cinema, which is nice. It's a nice, like I said already, uh, change of pace. But yeah, so uh, to elaborate a bit more on the the film's technical aspects, and so when I say uh, a movie's technical aspects, I refer I'm referring to the the production, the music, the editing, the camera work, etc. Basically, all the behind the scenes stuff that makes the movie happen. Everything outside of the story. And the characters and like the the inner the the internal universe, I guess, basically, right? So um, about this movie, I would say technically uh, the the film is it's much closer to being a play, uh, like a stage production, than it is a feature length film, at least in the modern sense. Yes, uh, like I said before, the the pre code era, uh, from what I know about it, it was very much a transitional phase uh, for the cinematic medium as a whole, right? So. You know, uh, like for example, a, a fair amount of, of silent films from the tens and the twenties, and so or even the nineteen aughts, I guess nineteen aughts, tens, twenties, uh, the, so forth. They they shared a lot of they shared many common elements with plays, right? And this is basically like that, but um, but as a talkie, so with with actual audio, uh, right? And to be honest, I, I like it. I like it a lot. Uh, I, I think it's a style that's uh, I think it's a style that that's more it's it's perfectly suited to noir uh, for to film noir and like mystery and detective and crime that sort of like that, that underbelly kind of like like uh, I guess just exploration of well, hold on let me take a sip real quick sorry I usually have I usually have a second person to cover the silences between sips but yeah I just uh, anyway. Um, what am I trying to say here? Film noir, uh, in general, I don't really like it too much, but I was, I was younger when I didn't like it. You know what I mean? So I, I'm, I'm using these, this pre-code marathon that I, I haven't really fully announced yet, but I'm basically gonna, that's probably what I'm going to do with this, uh, solo series is I'm just going to cover a bunch of different pre-code, uh, movies and get into that rabbit hole so that I can experience that particular era of, uh, film because I don't know too much about it. And it seems really interesting. I, I like the rawness of it. I like the sort of the seediness of it too, because that that's a big thing, right? Like I said, noir, um, a film noir, from what I know about it, they, from what I can gather, I mean, from what you can assume, right? It, it probably uses the, it uses that kind of story, that kind of narrative as a way to sort of, uh, make commentary, right? To make social commentary, to examine the world, to challenge the, um, the conventional views of the the times in which the movie is made or, or the times in which the, the movie is set, right? It's it's like how people use comedy to criticize things, right? It's like how, for example, back in medieval times, like the court jester, jester would uh, make fun of the royalty by making jokes. And that's the only way that anybody could really criticize uh, the royalty, the people in power, was by turning it into a performance, turning it into something to, that, that could be laughed at, something that could be taken uh, more lightly taking taken in jest right 
this is kind of like that, but in the opposite direction. You know, it's it's a mystery. It's a it's all murder. It's all kind of the, the bad stuff. It's all the the stuff that the uncomfortable stuff that the unpleasant stuff that nobody wants to talk about. Right? It's like with literature. It's like a lot of books are written uh, because uh, people in polite society they they won't talk about it otherwise. So they won't pay attention to it otherwise. They they aren't willing to face it otherwise. So you have to put it into to writing in order for people to to actually pay attention to it properly to give it the the focus that it deserves right similar uh, uh noir seems to be a similar thing but but an, a- analogous to uh to film and i get that you know it's not the only genre that does that but it it's that seems to be a, a characteristic of it a prominent feature of it is that through all of this sort of pot boiling violent stuff uh subject matter and, and these this explicit sexuality and all of that all of those those seedy underworld underbelly things it's like that's how you get into the nitty-gritty that's how you challenge uh, the times in which you lived. That, that's how that's how at least smart noir directors and writers and everything would would go about doing it. But that seems to be a, a key feature of the nar- of the the genre itself, right? As a whole, and so to me, like this this pre code style, that it perfectly suits that. Like it's 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 the it's a match made in heaven, isn't it? It's this rawness. It's this intimacy. It's this stripped back quality. It makes it feel a bit realer than. Uh, a bit realer, a bit more organic. The, the emotions are much stronger. They're much more palpable than you would get in something that's sanitized and something that has to kowtow, uh, kowtow to something to a set of rules or whatever, a set of basically, yeah, of, of like uh, of artistic and creative guidelines that you can't you can't really break. You can't get past those barriers or those restrictions, which is really fucking irritating because um you know I don't care about the socio political stuff. I, what I care about is the artistry of it. You know. I, I care about people being able to tell the kinds of stories that they want to tell and uh, to do so with as few inhibitions and as few uh, restrictions as possible, right? To be able to express themselves to the full. I don't like when people are, have, I don't like when creatives have uh, restrictions placed on them, right? That that kills art. And so, yeah, it's, it, it's kind of a pain in the eye. It's really disappointing to think about. It's really frustrating, honestly. I didn't think I'd be frustrated watching pre-code stuff. I just thought it was like, oh, this is a little weird, like obscure uh, era in uh, uh, film history, so I'll just I'll check it out. But it's like no, I'm kind of mad now. Like the more I think about it, the more irritating it is. Like shit, what a wasted, uh, what a wasted, uh, what wasted potential. You know what wasted opportunity. Who knows where things could have gone? Like I said at the, the start of this episode, right? Who knows where things could have gone if uh, people had just left them alone, let the artists uh, make their art, right? We probably would have had the '60s and the '40s uh, for for all we know, really. I, I don't know, but um, yeah, it sucks. God, all the repression, it's like, it was so, it was avoidable. It was so unnecessary. It could have been avoided entirely, but, uh, yeah, yeah, that's bad. Oh, that's rough. Yeah. From what I know of it anyway, again, I'm not, I wasn't around at, like 80 years ago when all of this was happening. So, uh, hard for me to say, but, uh, yeah, it's irritating nonetheless. So, um, uh, it was 80 years ago, right? Let me, let me get my calculator real quick to make sure I'm not, I don't sound completely dumb. Uh, so 2020, so it's 2021 right now, uh, as you probably know, uh, and, oh God, I got to try again. Sorry. So 2021 minus, uh, I'm just putting in my calculator here, 1932. This movie was made in 1932. It is 89 years old. It's almost 90 years old at this point. Uh, so that, that's fantastic. Right. Uh, almost, a, yeah, close to a century old, kind of, right. Like only a decade shy uh, of being a hundred years old pretty weird 90 years old man 89 years old that, that's uh that's something but yeah uh so like i was saying about pre-code uh film i guess movie making or storytelling techniques it's i like it and it's a style that like i said is perfectly suited for noir for sure uh detective crime stuff but um but even with with something like a romance even with genres like romance uh i, I like uh, like this movie is, is, a, is a romance uh it helps it the, the techniques they, they they still they help to bring out the uh, the story they help to bring it to life uh, more effectively than something polished and sanitized would like I was saying earlier uh, the the story is told the way the writers chose to tell it right and you get a sense of that as you watch you get a sense that this is the specific way that the people working on it wanted to to make it uh, and it's like it's cool it's really refreshing to see it's something that I didn't even know was possible to be honest kind of. In, in a way, in a weird sort of way, I guess. But yeah, um, I don't know why my light keeps my 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 laptop keeps auto focusing. It's kind of annoying. Sorry about that. Uh, hopefully, it's not too washed out in the final version. But um, yeah, 
So uh, moving further into the discussion portion of the, uh, the podcast, uh, what did I think of the characters? The characters themselves, of course, this is a, like I said before, this is a very character driven drama uh, or story. Oh, it is a, it's a rom- rom- romantic comedy drama, I guess. Mostly drama though. Uh, but there's, you know, there's a lot, there's some comedy in there too. Uh, but what do I think of the characters? Uh, so I guess, well, there are really only three. Uh, there are some supporting characters, but I don't even think I'll bother talking about them. I'll just cover the main three, right? So, um, we'll start with Max because he's the, we'll go from least to great. We'll go from like least important to most important, I guess. Uh, least central to most central. So, uh, Max, Max is the, the doctor, of course. He's the young, uh, Jewish doctor who is with Pat at the beginning, but ends up uh, kind of moving on with his life and is, you know, he has to end the relationship in order to be successful in other places, right? Uh, and then he wants to come back and, and have the relationship anyway. He kind of wants to have, all, have it all, you know, uh, but can't. Uh, and, and so Max, to, to me, he's, he's, he's interesting. You know, he's a really interesting character uh, and, and interesting in, in that he, he starts out the film as the, I guess, the POV like uh, character, the protagonist, right? You, you think he's going to be the protagonist. He's, he's a false protagonist almost. That's another interesting thing too. It's like the, the movie really makes it seem as though he's going to be the main character. And then he's not. He's the bad guy by the end of it almost. He, he, ends, it at, he ends the movie as an antagonist of sorts, you know? So that, that's another like weird uh, deviation from the, the typical formula. And it's really, it's, it's like, wow, like I, I, didn't, I didn't see that coming. It makes me, I don't really even know how to feel about it kind of in a way. Right. But yeah, so, so in a way, his, um, his characterization, Max's characterization it is accurate. It's actually pretty accurate to the ways that uh, people tend to change in real life. Right. Because um, I think the main case in point for this uh, being that the, uh, the love that he has for Pat, it goes from being youthful and pure and lovey dovey to, to the source of a lot of, of frankly, like, like dysfunctional behavior uh, on his part towards the end of the movie. Right, uh, because when it comes down to it, he, he's a pretty awful person, uh, Max. Uh, because I mean, for one, he, he's too like first, he, he's too cowardly to uh, to pull out of a loveless marriage and and take charge of his own life and and uh, and tell his parents like, you know what, I, I appreciate everything you've done for me, but this just isn't what I want to do. Like, I'm in love with this other girl, Pat. She's the one for me. I can't marry this this other this this you know this chick that you guys have got for me. Uh, I just don't, I don't feel anything for her. I care more about, um, I want to spend the rest of my life with Pat. He didn't do that. He, he was a coward. He was, he, he chickened out, you know, he wimped out. Um, yeah, like he, he made that mistake. Like that was, this is, that's the whole reason why all this happens. If he had just had the nerve to tell his parents just how he feels and everything and, and go his own direction and just, I guess, be a man in, in that sense, uh, he wouldn't be, be an adult in that sense. He wouldn't have had uh, any of this, none of this would have happened. Like the, the movie wouldn't have happened if he had just done that, but no, he made a, that was his fatal flaw. That was his major error. And, um, and when he regrets doing all of that or not doing all of that, uh, he, he then tries to pull Pat back into a relationship that that's long and dead. And, and he refuses to see that, it, that, that it ended a long time ago between them. And that, uh, and he ends up becoming completely self-serving and, you know, self-serving, selfish by, by the end of the movie. He's like totally, it completely consumes him, this this obsession with getting back together with Pat um, to the point where he barely even acknowledges her existence, paradoxically enough. Like it isn't even about her anymore. It's just about having her. It's just about the idea of being with her and having everything else at the same time. He kind of just wants it all at this point. You know, he's like, it's like a Citizen Kane thing. It really is. He, he ends up getting consumed by power and control and all that, you know, uh, it, it gets to him corrupts him and uh yeah he, he certainly he certainly doesn't uh have any regard for her feelings he doesn't consider them at all in any of this uh despite how clear she makes them to him repeatedly throughout the, the course of the narrative like he tells her about a million she tells him about a million times like that that she doesn't want to be with him anymore and that she's moved on and that she wants to be faithful to her new you know that she wants to that she's committed to her new relationship and he's like just a lot of, yeah, 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 yeah. He's, he's like, yada, 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 wait, waiting for her to, to shut up so that he can, you know, try to, try to, to just, just keep going. He just doesn't care. It's in one ear and out the other for him. He doesn't pay it any mind at all whatsoever. No, no consideration, no nothing. And this is supposedly someone that he, uh, cares a lot about, you know, has a lot of affection for, but, uh, apparently not. Right. Another sip. Hold on a sec.
Oh, that is good. God, oh, that's what I needed. I don't know why my throat's so sore, but uh, yeah, God. Okay, so anyway. Yeah, so yeah, he's, he's pretty bad, but um, in a very grounded way, I would say. In a very grounded way, especially for a film of this kind. And especially for for 1932, I guess, but that that's not like a, a like a, a a stab at 1932 or like the 30s in general or anything like that. I just I'm just it's 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 good. It's a good thing. It's like wow. Um, it's it, when I say that when I say like especially for 1932, what I mean is more so that it's pleasantly surprising that uh, they had that stuff all the way back then that these kinds of stories have been told for have been told that long and it's also it's it's that but it's also i guess an appreciation or maybe it's like maybe it's almost like a correction on my part right maybe it's like me i think it's I, the best way to describe it would be like me saying so when i say like even for 1932 i guess it's more so me kind of telling myself like wow i should expect i should i should um not uh, be so condescending towards the past just because something's old doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad that's a mindset that a lot of us seem to have for some reason maybe it's a natural human instinct or whatever but it's like no come on you know what does that even mean correlation is not necessarily causation you've got a weird way of thinking of things i just i think our general framework of understanding for a lot of what goes on what of what went on in history and what continues to go on in history is just kind of wrong uh, generally speaking i don't think our public school system uh is good enough at, at a kind of parsing the kind of uh, I, I, detailing the nuances of, of just life in general to us, uh, at least here in the States. So, but I don't know. Anyway. Um, but yeah, it's definitely not a jab at the past or anything. I just, I want to make that as clear as possible because um, I'm a huge fan of the past. I'm not like, you know, I'm not like I'm, I'm a retro film guy. I'm not, I'm like really big on the, I, I'm obsessed. I wish I was born in the thirties when everything was, you know, everyone was starving to death and, you know, it's like, no, I'm not one of those, but like, uh, yeah, please don't think I'm one of those, but yeah, it's just, uh, anyway, um, if you couldn't, I mean, if you, you know, you can't really see this cause of the filter, but this is, uh, Ava Gardner here, you know, Ooh. uh, so th th there were a lot of good things from the past. Let's just say a lot of good from the past. Uh, certainly, certainly I had a lot to be envious of back then and a lot to not be, you know, there's a lot to be grateful for here in, uh, the, the times we're living in these days, we got a lot that, uh, but anyway, what am I talking about? Why am I going on this, this whole pirate? Let's, uh, let's stay on topic. Uh, so yeah, we talked about, uh, uh, Max, right. Uh, moving on to Eddie, the second most important character, maybe arguably, maybe he's the main character. I'm not, I think all three of them are sort of the main characters. Like the main character is the, the love triangle, I guess. But, um, yeah, Eddie's, he's kind of like the second main character. I think, I think Pat's the central figure in all of it, but, um, We'll get into that in a second, obviously. All right, but so Eddie, he's sort of the, he's like diametrically opposed to Max in every single way, right? He's the opposite of him. He's like his perfect opposite, right? Uh, because Eddie, he, he's, you know, he's, he's likable. He's everything that Max is, Max is not, right? He's, he's likable, even though Max was likable at the beginning, but you know, he, he's charismatic, let's just say, uh, street smart and, and, and a little childlike, but, uh, but honest and to the point. And, and also someone who isn't willing to put up with a, anybody else's crap right he's not willing to, to take anybody else's nonsense when it comes down to it and and yeah in that respect he is the exact opposite of max um and and they they almost have they, they have like absolutely nothing in common save for the fact that they're both in love with pat right save for the fact that they're both after the same girl um and and so you know wh whereas max caters to to everybody right whereas max is the type of person to give into the demands of others to, to make other people happy um, not, not even in like a self-sacrificial way, but just in a, in a, like a cowardly way, in a meek way, you know, whereas Max caters to everyone without standing up for himself, you know, going and doing everything that his family asks him, uh, just because they ask him to, right. Um, Eddie is the kind of person who, who is not that at all. He's the kind of person who will like literally force the, the clerk at the hotel he's trying to have his honeymoon at to, uh, to tell off the, uh, the rude uh, noisy neighbors in the room next door, right? Because that, that was the whole problem is that they were trying to have their honeymoon and there was this party going on in the room next to like directly next to theirs. And, uh, they wouldn't uh, keep quiet even though they, they'd asked them repeatedly to do so. Uh, so yeah, Eddie's the type of person who will insist that, uh, the people at the hotel he's staying at will, will, will take care of something like that. He, he doesn't, he's not gonna, uh, he's not gonna give in. He's not gonna let people pull one over on him. He's gonna do what he needs to do in order to make what he wants to happen, happen. You know, in order to see 
uh, justice through and all that, right? I guess to a certain extent, he's not going to take anybody's crap. Basically, that, that's that's the long and short of it. Um, he's a fully fledged man, a fully fledged adult, uh, without even having to think twice about it. It just comes to him naturally. It's just it's just it's it's just a given. Uh, whereas uh, Max, Max, he, he's very snaky. You know, he's a bit of like he's a bit of a snake. You know, uh, he he has to Max has to resort to uh, to manipulation and status and money. And, and like all this behind the scenes maneuvering in order to even have like a chance at getting what he wants, which was ultimately that that was ultimately proved to be his character's uh, downfall. Right. Because, again, if Max had just told his family about Pat, uh, it doesn't even have to be overly insulting about it. It doesn't have to break any sort of uh, bonds or, or burn any sort of bridges just to to tell them this. You know, like he could have just uh, confessed his feelings for her, you know, uh, made it very clear where he stands on their relationship and, and what they have together. And, uh, and none of, none of the movie would have happened. It wouldn't have even happened at all. You know, the movie could have just been about their, their marriage or something. It could have just been about all of the years, all the happy years that came. And it wouldn't be a very interesting movie without tension or whatever, but that's might that might've very well been how, uh, the outcome would have, uh, turned out to be if uh, he hadn't, uh, been stupid about it, you know, but, but no, his, his failures in the end, his failures paved the way for, uh, for, uh, Eddie's successes, and that's that's really there, all there is to be said about it. It's pretty funny. Um, I like the irony in that. You know, it's very clever, uh, cleverly written, right? But yeah, um, out of all, all out of all three of them, I would say Pat is the. Uh, so yeah. Oh, uh, I, oh man, I didn't. Oh, so funny enough, I I didn't. Uh, you can tell I'm very professional. Uh, you can tell that this isn't the uh, the second episode of this series ever, right? But no, um, so I I wrote in my notes here. I was going to write about Pat, but I only, I, I, don't, I don't think I finished it. All I wrote was that um, out of all three of the main characters, Pat is probably the film's protagonist, right? Because um, she's the one that's stuck uh, having to pick between both of the men. And we're, you know, as the viewers, I guess we're supposed to uh, maybe not relate to her the most, but, but definitely connect to her the most and kind of sympathize with her the most and get behind her the most and, and go like, well, look at it from her perspective, like which guy is better for her, you know, what's going to work out in the end that she's like, she's our character, um, through and through, let's just say. Um, but I really like her. I really like her. And I like the actress who portrayed her. She didn't, uh, she wasn't a big, a big name. And, uh, she, in real life, she actually had a pretty depressing, uh, end. like she got married, she got married once, divorced him, uh, got married twice, got married a second time. And that guy died in 51. And then she just, she ended up uh, dying 30 years later herself spent 30 years as like a recluse though as like a hermit it's pretty sad actually like she just kind of you know and didn't make any movies after i think it was like the 50s like 56 or something so yeah it's kind of kind of a bummer because she's really good in this like I, I like her i like her charisma like she's very subtle she's very subtle but i, I like subtle i like quiet i like uh you know i like um not necessarily quiet but um muted or toned down i guess a bit like it's not all up in your face and stuff. It's like, this is a real person. I feel that that character is a real person. That's someone I could run into on the street and, you know, someone I could, uh, you know, talk to in a bar or whatever, just, just things like that. Like that's, that's who her character was. That's who Pat was. It was, it was really, really good performance. Um, and you like her, you know, you, you like her, you can get behind her. And I, I, I didn't, I didn't really think she was overly like attractive or appealing or whatever at the beginning. I, I thought she was just, you know, run of the mill, but it's like, as time goes on, the more you watch her, the more scenes she's in, the more she kind of uh, blossoms and kind of comes to life. And it's like, wow, I really like this is a this is a very fleshed out uh, character. And, and, you know, uh, it's it's good to see, you know, and I, I like it. I like uh, I like her a lot. Like it, the movie makes you like her. It does what it's supposed to. Right. So, yeah, out of all of them, um, the only thing I'll say well, no, I get, well, I guess just a minor nitpick. Um, I, I kind of feel as though she could have been a bit more at the end when, um, she gets Eddie out of jail and she, she, you know, reassures him that, uh, she's not with Max anymore. I, I kind of felt like her, her, the way she was characterized and that was a little naive. It's like, she should have, I, I feel like just who she was in every other scene. It's like, you would have thought that it would logically follow that she would be self-aware you know, that she would be aware of how weird the situation is. And like, you know, and, and like, I, I just don't feel like she convinced him enough that um, she wasn't seeing Max because it really did seem like she was And it. You know, I don't know. Like just the way that 
and and then just the whole thing with Max just being around all the time in general. It's like I wouldn't be surprised if uh, she actually did, um, you know, sleep with him or something again. It's like just the way they portrayed it. It's like they should have made it much more, much clearer that she didn't, because uh, there was there was room in there for her to have, I guess. And that was weird because the first half of the movie made it clear that she w- she wouldn't, but then the second half, like the last two scenes, it's kind of like uh, they could have spent some more time um, elaborating elucidating getting into it a little more just to make it abundantly clear maybe i'm just the idiot on that but it's like i kind of felt like they didn't they weren't even they weren't uh, equal enough they didn't balance their treatment of that one particular aspect of the movie uh as well as they could have perhaps uh but maybe that's just me which is minor minor little nitpick on my part but no um yeah she's probably my favorite character to be honest i, I really enjoyed uh that performance it was, it was good it's just really good in a very understated uh, you know, understated, subtle, very like natural, organic kind of way. And that's what I liked about it. But yeah. Um, so then uh, from there, uh, what did I think of the actual story itself, the actual story of the movie? Uh, well, it's it's an adaptation of a, it's actually an adaptation of a short story uh, from a female writer of the time uh, named uh, Vina Del Mar. That was her pen name, Vina Del Mar. Uh, her real name was Alvina Louise Croder. Uh, who died, and she she died in 1990 at the age of 86. So she actually she lived a pretty good life, um, and and yeah, it's interesting. She actually has 21 credits to her name. Um, lots of uh, film adaptations of her movies, or well, uh, sorry, lots of film adaptations of her movies. Lots of uh, uh, movie adaptations of her of her books and stuff like her books and her stories, her literary work, the literary works, right? And and some screenplays, and even yeah, she's written some screenplays, and even. Like like original screenplays and even some uh, even a couple of plays as well, even if you like play plays. And and another quick fun fact about her, uh, Vina Del Mar, uh, she actually is that uh, she actually um, at one point in her life she actually uh, back in the twenties nineteen twenties she actually pretended to offer her husband for rent uh, through newspaper ads as a as a bit of a promotional stunt uh, because I guess they were both writers and they didn't have as much money as they would like to and so they did that as kind of like a you know, cheeky little thing, maybe get a little bit of attention, get a little bit of uh, awareness out about, I don't know, their personal situation or whatever. But yeah, I mean, she made it in the end. So uh, kudos to her. Congratulations for getting through all of that. Uh, you know, the Great Depression, the World War II, Vietnam, everything that happened in the 20th century. Lots of history, lots of lots of big moments, lots of big events, right? But yeah, um, anyway, so with, with regard to the story of the, the movie itself, with regard to the story of Uptown New York, um, I would say that it's, uh, I would describe it as simple, but effective. You know, it's kind of a, a textbook example of, uh, being simple, but effective, right? Because every, every, everything gets wrapped up in a pretty little bow by the end of it. There's a very clear, uh, very clear, very, um, I guess, uh, total, uh, or all consuming, uh, resolution to it, which is fine. Yeah. Maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just a pessimist or something. Maybe I, maybe I'm only happy when I see fictional characters suffer or something messed up like that, but it's like, yeah, uh, not because, I don't know. I, I thought the resolution was fine, but I, I don't even know what I'm talking about. I thought the resolution was, was good. Uh, uh, because even though, even though there is like this sort of, I guess, all consuming or like, like overly conventional, not even overly conventional, but just conventional standard, uh, resolution at the end. Um, there's, there's still a lot of like doubt, plenty of like doubt and tension that the, uh, viewer experiences along the way, right. To get to that ending. Um, and that's important, right. Uh, and, and just for me personally, uh, based on the, cause based on the vague synopsis I'd read about, uh, uh the movie before watching, uh, I, I actually thought that the movie would be focused more on Max himself, right? I thought it was actually going to be about Max going to Vienna, like his experience in Vienna, uh, as a doctor or whatever. Like I, I thought that was going to be the whole movie, but it, it wasn't at all. It was completely different. You know, it turns out that, uh, Pat and Eddie are, are the main characters and that it's all in New York and that it's, uh it's about the aftermath of that initial conflict. It's it, because that, that's what I like about this movie a lot. Like, I, I don't think I've really said it enough is that, um, it kind of, it's like a false, you know, it's like a false protagonist, but it's also like a, a false movie within a movie, right? Like they set up like a completely different movie in the very beginning by having this whole, uh, conflict with, uh, this whole issue between Max and Pat and, and Max's family and their expectations of him versus Max's, uh, feelings towards Pat, and and you think that that's going to be the premise, right? But then it's not. It, it's a false premise. It's like a false movie within the movie because then that that's like all taken care of. That's like all. That's not really resolved, but it's like it's all uh, 
pushed away within the first like 15 minutes of the film. And then the rest of it's basically a completely different story that continues off of that. So it's almost like the movie has a prequel within the film itself. But I guess that's a lot of things, right? But, you know, you, you got flashbacks and everything and you've got, you know, extended flashbacks and a lot of stuff too. But yeah, anyway, it was, it was a nice little touch. It's like unique. Like I, I want to see more movies like that. Like this is a good structure. This is really cool. Like there's a lot of possibility here. It's ripe for storytelling uh, and all that. But um, I don't know. It was really good. I, I'd like to see more of it. I definitely for sure. But yeah. In any case, uh, the movie overall, like the story of the movie overall, uh, it's very engaging. Uh, and, and it doesn't drag out too long, for too long. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, artificially pad out its runtime or anything like that. Like it tells the story it wants to tell and it does so, uh, perfectly. It covers all of the bases and it gets into the concept as much as it needs to. And, uh, that's really all there needs to be said about that. Uh, really, um, it's very engaging as well. Uh, and, and the touch of realism from the pre-code technique, uh, makes it very easy to get invested in. And, and, you know, all, all in all, uh, you know, it's, it's movies like this that I think just in general, they, they go to show that you don't need uh, much more than, than a talented cast, you know, talented actors and good writing in order to make uh, good cinema, in order to make good entertainment in general. You know, uh, the, the, the glitz and glamour of like Hollywood or whatever, they, they really have no place in a story like this, I wouldn't say. Uh, and, and I wish the industry today, just the entertainment industry in general. I wish it would it would recognize that uh, more. I wish it would recognize that this is an option more often, right? And make films like this on a more regular basis. And it's weird because it's just such, such a weird dynamic, isn't it? It's like I, I don't feel like it's too much to ask that uh, that these big companies and stuff don't uh, that these big companies not risk everything on on these like billion dollar blockbusters all the time, so that so, so you know so audiences can get a bit more. Uh, variety in what's being released. It's like, geez, why do you guys want to gamble? Why do you guys want to suicidally gamble everything you have on these like low, co lowest common denominator schlock fests? Like when you could just you could just delegate everything. Like the corporate side of things, you could just let the small people, let the creatives, like you know, have their fun or whatever with tiny budgets and just you know, like just have it be a thing. Just do that. Like it's what's the risk? What's the risk? What's the what's the what are you putting into that? Meanwhile, you're you're just it, this, the new formula they've got is so it's so self destructive. I mean, like, gosh, we're gonna look back on it in like ten years and laugh. It's just such a joke. It's so it's such a mess. Like they have so much right now, and they're just gonna throw it all away. It's like, ugh, gosh, modern Hollywood, modern Hollywood, man, how far they've fallen. Although, I mean, I guess some could argue that they never really uh, flew, or they were never really they never really had uh, much of a height to fall from in the first place, but. uh that's, you know, that's, that's a, a discussion for another time, let's say. But yeah, um, let me just take another sip here. Oh gosh, I, I hate my light. I hate how it's, it's auto-focusing constantly. You know, I just, I want constant, I just want regular standard light that just uh, doesn't deviate throughout the entire recording, but I guess we can't have things like that because, uh, I don't know, we just can't because I'm an amateur. But kind of like how, you know, it is with the pre-code stuff. It's like, I'd like to think that that's what makes my videos fun, maybe, for all of the, whatever, I don't know, two people watching it. But again, I don't, I actually don't want people to watch me. Uh, it's better this way. Uh, we're coming up to the end of our discussion here. I kind of, um, when I was writing the script for, for this uh, episode of the, the, my solo, you know, the solo podcast, uh, Coffee with Holden, which I haven't done enough with yet, uh, I, I kind of, I think I wrote too many questions honestly i kind of talked about i feel like there's not much to say uh that i haven't said already with regard to these but um we'll we'll, we'll run through them anyway and then I'll, I'll end with some i guess final thoughts about the whole movie in general right so uh, uh favorite scenes or moments uh well for me uh i think my favorite scene if i had to highlight them uh it would probably be like my, my top would probably be the scene where max uses uh pat's phone in her apartment to call a cab and uses that as an excuse to, to spend the night with her uh, I really did think that uh, Max was going to be the hero at the beginning, right? But I guess even in the scenes where he was supposed to be, like, honestly, he, he was always a bit shady when it comes down to it. Like, yeah, you could interpret that as a romantic gesture, but it's also a bit manipulative, isn't it? It's almost a bit, like, sociopathic, isn't it? Like, you know, it's just kind of like, eh, why don't you just why don't you just be upfront with her? It's like, she's your girlfriend, isn't she? You, you shouldn't have to weed around, uh, like, behind the scenes and stuff just to, 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 you know, spend time with her or whatever. It's like, if you want to 
if you want to spend time with her, just talk to her, like communicate with her. Open communication. Communication is a very important uh, ingredient in, in, in a healthy relationship and all that. But it is, it really, like it really is like, you know, you can make fun of that all you want, but it's like genuine advice. It's like, it's like, like I, like this, the cliche is true. Like cliches are cliches for a reason a lot of the time. But yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, that's, yeah, he's always a bit shady. So I, I like the nuance there. And then I also, of course, I, I think it's funny when he throws the coin out to the, uh, the cabbie. He pays for the cab, cabbie's fare. And the cabbie, like, he just gets it. Like, he's not even confused or anything. He just kind of, he just takes the coin. He's like, so long. I'm going to go off and pick up my other uh, people now. It's like, I just, it's like, he gets it. He's like, he's in the know. He's been there before. I, I've been there, bro. It's kind of, I, I like, I thought that was a nice little touch. Uh, it's it's a bit, it's it's funny and charming, you know, in, 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 in its way. Uh, but I also, I also, so there's that scene, but then I, I also really like the scene where, uh, Eddie proposes to Pat in the, the recovery room at the wrestling arena after he has one of the wrestlers, like literally land, like directly on top of him. Uh, and when he's, when he's recovered in that little room off to the side in whatever like convention center that they're in watching the wrestling match. Right. Um, very charismatic performances from both Pat and Eddie in that scene. And uh, it was re- it was interesting to see how their in- interactions would play out, uh, not only at the end of that scene, but in the you know for the remainder of the film. Ah, uh, I just can't get this lighting right. I'm really gonna have to I'm gonna have to play with this later. But yeah, uh, and then I guess on the opposite side of that, on the other end of that, uh, least favorite some of my least favorite scenes or moments uh, overall. Uh, I don't know. I, I I guess if I had to if I had to, to pick something, I guess I would say uh, some of the slapstick stuff maybe. Uh, I just felt a bit forced compared to everything else that was that was in the movie overall. Like when, uh, for example, when Eddie has to rescue Pat from the bathroom of the diner, right? Or during the wrestling match scene, uh, where various members of the audience they they act ridiculous for the sake of a few cheap laughs, you know? Um, yeah, like, well, because when Eddie has to rescue Pat from the 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 uh, bathroom at the diner, he ha- he gets on top of the uh, owner and the owner's like this stereotypical Italian guy or whatever. And, and he, he like punches the window. Uh, and then like they drag, uh, they, like they, they like lift, uh, they lift Pat out of the, the bathroom and like, you know, bathroom window. And they like, they like put her down. It's like, it's just, it's a whole like ridiculous sort of Charlie Chaplin esque, but very like, you know, but it's just slapsticky. I don't really like slapstick. I don't know. It's not my thing at all. Never been into like Three Stooges or, you know, Chaplin or anything like that. Buster Keaton. Just not my thing. It just really isn't my thing at all. I don't, I don't, I just don't think it's entertaining at all. It's just not, not for me. Um, but yeah, entertaining subjectively. I, I, there's, I'm, I get it, but like, I just don't get it for me personally. I just, I'm just not with it. But yeah, that's just me. Um, but yeah, uh, during the wrestling scene, yeah, during the wrestling match, uh, scenes, I guess, or scene, um, there are a lot of people in the audience who, who are kind of weirdos or whatever. Uh, and and they're like, there's, there's like this man making these really like exaggerated faces, uh, like as he's watching the wrestlers fight. And then there's also the, the, this like couple of other, you know, there's like a, a couple of other guys who are going through like this, this weird, you know, farcical uh, ritual. Uh, I guess the best way to explain it, it's like there's, so there's, there's this one guy who's like, uh, like, you know, trying like, like kind of like, uh, slamming his, um, I guess his elbows or like his hands down onto his, uh, his knees or his thighs. Every time the, uh, the wrestlers grab each other, like he's doing that out of suspense. Like he's kind of synchronized with it. He's keeping with the beat almost kind of. Um, and every time he does that, the guy next to him, he has like walnuts or something that he's trying to crack the shells open with, you know, trying to crack the shells open. So like the guy will put like a walnut, like where the, the dude's hand is so that the dude can like smack it open for him uh so that he can eat it um oh it's just like i thought it was funny you know i i, I kind of i laughed at it when it was happening but um yeah like i just uh, they, they, they weren't they, see that this stuff it's not offensively awful or anything like that it's like far far from being that bad um because again i actually laughed a bit when i saw all of those those moments um, but, but if I had to, but it's just, if I had to pick something to complain about in the movie, uh, that would be the one thing I would complain about. I would say it just seemed a bit out of place compared to, to everything else that goes on, I guess. And, and Dem- like based on the, the, like the coin scene and stuff like that humor and some, like a lot of like Pat's like comebacks to, uh, to Max, like when he's like, let's get back together. Let's get back together, honey. And she's just like, no, you're, you're gone. Like, what are you, what are you doing here? Like, like, and she, she would make jokes and stuff like, uh, 
that was all very funny and it was funny in a very subtle, uh, clever way. And I just, I, I think slapstick is kind of, it's just easy. You know, it's just a little, it's like kind of like the, the easier way out. There's a lot you can do with it, but it's like, I just, I felt as though the writers uh, on this one, they had a style that was going for them that just completely clashed with the slapstick stuff. And they were, they were just a little, they were better for it. They were, they were too good for it almost in a way. Not, not to, not to, again, not to like shit, not to poop all over, um, sorry, not to poop all over, not to defecate all over, uh, good old slapstick, but it's just really not for me. You know, it just really isn't. Uh, so there you have it. Um, but yeah, again, I, I asked, I think I asked way too many questions, uh, of myself. I don't really think we need to get this into it, but, uh, yeah. Um, you know what? Maybe I won't answer it. Well, no, no, I will. I will. Let's just, let's go through with it. So, uh, some of the movie's pros or, or strengths, what were some of the movie's pros or strengths? Uh, well, for me, uh, the mood it creates just overall, j just in general, the, the high amount of investment that it can bring out in the viewer without having to do much at all. Uh, I, I like minimalistic productions like this one, uh, but with the intricacies of, uh, of the cinematic media mixed in, right. Uh, thrown into the mix. Uh, it, it uh, for, for me, plays and, and theater stuff, stage stuff, it, that's a step too far. Uh, for me in terms of like the minimalism, but, um, this is perfect. Like these, these kinds of movies are perfect. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing more like it. Uh, and then some of the movies, uh, on the other hand, some of the movies cons or weaknesses, uh, maybe it's not a weakness, but, but you'd think that a movie like this would try and make the female protagonists, uh, or the, the female leads, uh, decision between the two male lovers to, between the two male love interests, uh, as difficult as possible, right? You would want to have that conflict there. And they, there is conflict and tension in this movie, but it's different. It's a, it's a different kind of tension. It's not what you would expect, I guess. Uh, but but in all honesty, because like because in all honesty, like there's there, between the two of between Max and Eddie, there's just there's no competition whatsoever. They clearly establish that Eddie is the much better guy, right? Because Max, you know, he may be rich and successful and all that, but but he's a piece of garbage. Like they 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 make it very clear that he's a piece of garbage who can't can't go back on his mistake of not going against his. Uh, parents' wishes and, and marrying Pat when he had the chance to. When he had that golden opportunity, when he when he was in that moment, he made the absolute wrong decision. And that's it. That's all there is to be said. Like the that's done. It's done and over with. Move on, you know? If he'd had the spine for it, he, he would have taken her to Vienna with him, uh, to, to go to that course that he was gonna take, uh, when he left for the first time, right? But now it's far too late. Uh but now it's far too late and and what's worse is that he's trying to He's still trying to force it not to be, right? And he's, he doesn't care if it hurts Pat in the process. He doesn't care if it's not what she wants anymore. He just doesn't care. He cares about himself. And, and uh, you know, I, I classed this, this characterization of him as a, as, a, as a weakness of the film. But to be honest, like I said before, it's nuanced and realistic enough to be uh, a strength. It's just, I guess just from a narrative perspective, it's confusing within the context of the story itself, right? Uh, why they would choose, why the people, why the, the people behind it would choose to portray him as so clearly undesirable uh, when, when compared to uh, Eddie, because you know when the audience is, is theoretically, you know, at least in theory, um, supposed to feel as conflicted about uh, the decision between, you know, choosing between uh, Eddie and good old, uh, well, good old Eddie and then Max uh, as Pat herself, right? She, we're supposed to kind of be in her shoes, even if we're not, like, you know, even if we're not all women or whatever like it's like we're all supposed to feel that right like we're all supposed to be in that position um yeah and it's it's almost as if the movie is is accidentally better than it was supposed to be because of little weird little things like this but yeah anyway i digress so um uh with that we're, we're pretty much at the end of the uh the uh the podcast uh i i wrote down here uh just uh any other thoughts so this is all the millet uh, god miscellaneous i was gonna say miscellaneous miscellaneous topics that uh i didn't cover in the other questions you know anything else i want to add final thoughts so on and so forth uh, and before we get into them of course i got to take another swig because uh my throat really hurts today for some reason i don't know why i don't know why it's it's a uh, 5 a.m uh, as i'm recording this really bad i know i'm we have a terrible sleeping schedule but maybe it has something to do with that. I don't know, but it really hurt. Like, it's like really sore. And, uh, my tongue has like a bunch of weird, uh, like, uh, yeah, like it's kind of burnt for some reason, like at the back, it's got like sores and I can, like, I can feel the sores like chafing against my teeth. Uh, like my, the bottom row of my teeth, like, ugh, it's like the worst place to get a, a sore because it inflames the tongue, you know, and, and it's like, it gets into contact that, that shouldn't happen. 
right? But yeah, anyway, let me, let me take a sip of water real quick. Uh, all righty then. So yeah, uh, final thoughts. Um, in terms of, of this movie in general, like I just, uh, I want to try to speak off the cuff for a bit. I, I, I don't, I don't, you know, I gotta, I gotta figure out how to balance reading my script and, uh, being natural and being myself without repeating myself too much and saying, um, and like, and you know, a million times and so on and so forth. Anyway, uh, in terms of the movie though, like, uh, uh, it, I, it was a good one. It, this was a this was a good first film to start to like to kick off my this pre code Hollywood marathon that I'm going to go on, right? Uh, and so that that's the big announcement I guess I'm going to make now, right? Like, uh, so basically, my plan for this series for Coffee with Holden, I, I'm going to start off by training myself because I, I'm really, as you can tell, I'm not very used to doing things by myself, right? So I think what would help would be to kind of treat this like a job, you know, treat it like work. And just and do the work by making content because I, I I have this tendency of saying of talking a big talk without walking the actual walk right so I think I think the best thing for the show and for myself and for you guys uh, watching would be to uh, just uh, do a marathon do something that's all the same right eliminate all of the outside variables and stuff and just stick to one specific theme or one specific uh, project I guess and so for for this this series what we're gonna do is we're gonna start uh, a marathon. A pre-code marathon where we watch as many pre-code uh, Hollywood flicks as we possibly can, uh, get into all sorts of things, and just go down that that rabbit hole and and uh, have a different you know just a different movie every every episode and just keep going until I either get sick of it or or cover feel as though I've covered everything I need to cover or get better you know get better at just making this stuff and hosting and everything and, and doing it by myself because that that's really the main thing is that it's hard for me to I, I've had a hard time kind of getting the motivation to to sit in front of the camera for an hour when I'm just alone. Cause I, I've gotten very used to, uh, to having co-hosts on the, on the channel, you know, and, and I've done, I've done, I've done YouTube since, uh, on and off since, uh, 2013. Uh, so, you know, I've done a lot of stuff by my, I, I, I did it all by myself up until very recently. Uh, this channel sunset sea productions is actually the uh, first time that I've ever had other people on really, really at least the first real time, I guess it's the first real sort of collaborative project or undertaking that I've, I've had on, on the, the on the platform so far. And so it's, it's kind of silly to me that I, I can't, uh, that I have a hard time now that I'm like so rusty with the, with the solo, the mono a mono stuff, but um, we're back, you know, I, I'm bringing it back slowly, but surely uh, we'll have to, to uh, iron out the kinks a bit more though. Um, but I think for now, I, I'm, I'm pretty happy with this, this episode, this, this, this comeback. It's, it's a good comeback to the thing. Cause obviously it was it's been months since the last time I did a, a coffee with Holden, but I want to make this a regular thing because uh, I I know that there's a lot of space between uh, Imperial Tides episodes, and that's just because um, my co-host Simone um, he's still graduating from high school, so he's got to take care of uh, all of that. He's got a got a lot of projects and stuff going on, so there are big gaps between. That's the only reason that we can't be as uh, regular with it as we'd like to be. But um, definitely want to finish. Uh, God, I don't know why my mask is so itchy all of a sudden. Oh, that's like, forgive me. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we wanna we wanna finish all the the, the last uh, six parts of um, the German series that we're covering, uh, Berlin Alexander Plots, and then after that, I'll just talk about little general plans. Uh, we have thirteen solo episodes, not solo episodes. Sorry, thirteen like standalone episodes that will basically comprise uh, basically what I, I've always wanted the, the podcast to be in general. Um, just one-off movies that took, that caught my interest that I can find for free on YouTube, just a, a way to expand my tastes and learn more and, and just yeah, have fun, have a good time talking about it, uh, work on my public speaking and everything, uh, and not be, and my confidence just in general, and not be so afraid of the camera as I, I'm usually pretty terrified of it. <laughs> it just doesn't come naturally to me if you couldn't tell already, but yeah, um, so we'll have 13 episodes like that, which will basically be what I've always imagined the podcast to be, or like what the, the direction that I want the channel to go in. Um, so there's that. And then after that, we're probably going to do a 10 episode uh, Russian or Polish series called uh, Decalogue, which is about uh, the 10 commandments. It's basically each episode is a reimagining or a modern interpretation of one of the 10 commandments from the, uh, the old Testament, obviously, you know, 
the, the tablets and all that, the slabs and all that, right? But yeah, so that those are the plans for the channel in general. Uh, plans for this the series, uh, Coffee with Holden, in specific, in particular. Like I said, we're going to cover as much... Cl uh, I think we're going to go from pre-code Hollywood to maybe uh, the silent film era, then maybe back to, like, I guess, classic Hollywood, golden age Hollywood, 40s and, uh, you know, the, the rest of the 30s and then the 40s and the 50s, uh, and maybe from there move into the 60s, 70s, and then 80s, 90s, and 2000s, and maybe even contemporary stuff eventually. But yeah, I mean, I'm not, I don't have any, like, I'm not going to do it chronologically. I'm, I, we're just going to see what happens, basically. I don't want to be, like, so strict about it that I end up making it not fun. But I, I also want there to be order and structure and stuff. And so that's why we're going to start off by doing a marathon, just so I can, I can wean myself. You know, I can cut my teeth on something uh, a bit more manageable, I guess, and, and just do this big undertaking so that uh, I can get as much experience as possible in as much in as short a, a time frame as possible, I guess. That's kind of what I'm going for here with it. But yeah, uh, this was a good movie to start with. I, I, I almost wish that it was, um, that there was a bit more to it though. I kind of feel like, uh, I kind of feel like it was a little too simple, almost like a little bit, just a little bit. Like I, it was a bit minor, you know, it was a bit of a minor work to start out with. I kind of wish that it was, um, that it kind of, it blew me away a little more, took me, you know, th there was a little more to get into, but, um, I, I don't think it was awful or anything. I, 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 there was plenty to talk about. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, and then I guess the other thing I guess like, I could say real quick, I'm not sure if romance was, like I said before, I'm not sure if romance was necessarily the best genre for the pre-code approach. And I'm not sure if it, a romance was necessarily the best thing to start out with. I literally just picked the, I just picked a movie at random, just one that had an interesting title to me or whatever, uh, and, and rolled with it. But yeah, um, call me, maybe I'm a pessimist. Maybe I'm a, maybe I'm big into like self torture or something, but, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I'm actually really looking forward to, I'm, I'm itching to get into some of the, the heavy, like noir stuff, you know, which is something that I, I really never thought I'd say in a, in a million years, but I, I guess we've arrived at year uh, a million and one because I, I'm, I'm certainly saying it now, but yeah. Um, I am looking forward to the noir stuff. I think this approach would really, it would work very well with it. Um, sorry, I was just taking care of my stopwatch there real quick. Put that there. Uh, it's almost 6 a.m. now and I got to get to bed soon so I can fix my sleeping schedule so I can do one of these a night. It's, my goal is to try to get one of these out there a day, uh, but it takes a while to upload. So uh, please be patient with me if you are itching to get into more of my content, which if you are, really appreciate that. Like that's uh, that's fantastic, of course. But yeah. Um not really much else to say other than that. I've kind of I'm all talked out and uh like I said, uh this movie was it was good, but it was a little weird. Like I kind I, I wish there was a little more I kind of feel like I had to stretch out some things and I was repeating myself a little bit. If it had just a teeny bit more substance, uh I could have I would have been happy with it. But it's it's a good start. It's a good start, but I I, I I hope that there's, I hope that this isn't it. I hope that there's a lot more to get out of the pre-code stuff. There's obviously going to be, but, um, yeah, the playlist I'm using, it's from pizza flicks. So shout out to pizza flicks, actually great channel. Go subscribe to them because they, I have to thank them for all of the content that I'm about to put out myself. Right. But yeah. Um, yeah, they, uh, they, they have a, a like a 156 or like 146 something, uh, long video, long playlist of all just pre-code stuff. So that's what we're going to get into. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, I know that it was a little all over the place, kind of getting my, getting my bearings again, but I, I think it went pretty well and I think it was worth doing and I'm glad I did it because I was almost like hundred percent certain that I wasn't actually going to do it tonight, but I did. I followed through and, uh, I hope that I can discipline myself. Like I can stay that disciplined and focused, uh, for the many months to come, years to come. Like I, I want to do this pretty much forever always have this as something to, to fall back on as a pastime and so on and so forth. But yeah, anyway, without rambling on too much longer, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, if you did, uh, please do consider um, subscribing to the channel, uh, giving this video a like, uh, commenting in the, the comment section down below, engage with us. You know, we, we, part of what I, what I'm trying to do with, with all of this is, is kind of form a little community, you know, of people who are interested in the same things that um, Simone and I are interested in, you know, because this is really, it's very much a passion project on my part anyway. You know, I, I'm trying to, I, I want to make stuff that is intrinsically enjoyable, you know, like this is my passion. Like I, I enjoy, I'm not necessarily like a big movie guy, but I, I like, I like learning new things. I like 
getting out there and exposing myself to things that I might not have cared about otherwise, you know, stepping out of the comfort zone. And YouTube, like, it's the perfect pretext to do all of that. It's the perfect excuse to to get out there and try new things and just, you know, and, and get over yourself a little bit and just and, and work on yourself a bit, I guess. And um, yeah, like, I feel like I've grown a lot from, from doing it in the uh, short five months that I've been doing it for. So, and I hope to continue to do so for, for the many, like I said, for all the time that's going to come after. So yeah, with, uh, with that being said, uh, like third time, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed, um, do all those things that I said, you know, do all the fun stuff. Maybe we can get a little, uh, community going and, um, yeah, stay tuned. Uh, see you in the next one. Uh, take care and, uh, bye for now.